think I'm going to throw up if I see another supercar come out this month, the 30th McLaren release of Summer Alone. I'm just utterly fed up with it and I think I speak on behalf of a lot of people that when you're sitting there through Evo magazine or scrolling down your YouTube feed and you see yet another car for the 1%, it's a bit unattainable really, isn't it? And so I prefer cars that are aspirational yet attainable. The good news is that if you live in the UK at least, there are a lot of good cars you can have for under £10,000. And so these two cars here I have today, what makes them fun is they're aspirational, but they're not boring. They, they feel special still when you're behind the wheel. So what do we have? Well, we have two Z4 coupes. So, well, what's the difference really? Well, a lot. There's a surprising amount that's different between these two. The father that came first, the Z4 3 liter SI coupe. And so there's gonna be, I think, two of you watching right now. There's gonna be the part of you that's just like, isn't that a Z4 with a fixed roof? And then there's gonna be the other half of you that go, oh, this is basically a Z4 M Lite. And this can be had for a third of the price. It's a real driver-focused car that's a little bit less compromised day to day. But this is carrying its own weapons. It's got its own punches and it's got its tricks up its sleeve. So what makes this even tougher is that you have two completely different Z4 experiences at almost exactly the same price. So today we're going to find out which one is best for you. We're driving the E86 Z4 Coupe. And so this is the kind of Z4 M light in the eyes of many and I completely see why. Okay, it doesn't share that legendary straight six 3.2 from the E46 M3, but what it does have is one of the most robust, brilliant engines that BMW have ever made. Just their classic straight six uh, three liter engine. And it's, oh, it's just, it's just such a peach. It pulls so beautifully down low. It's so torquey and usable every day. And yet when you really want to play with it, it'll absolutely howl at you. Many people do see this as, okay, now that the Z4M is a collectible, which is going at 20,000 pounds plus for a nice coupe anyway, um, you know, that's a lot of money. And the upkeep of that engine particularly, and of M cars, is a lot more expensive. They're, they're kind of like a racehorse. They just require a lot, of, a lot of maintenance. So when you can get into one of these now comfortably for 8,000, 8,500 pounds, um, it's more comfortable to live with in its suspension. The engine is still an absolute peach for all roads you're really going to encounter. Maintenance is far easier. This, to me, is a brilliant ownership proposition below £10,000. It's, it's almost like a no-brainer. What's it like to drive in its own, its own regard? Well, okay, it has electric-assisted steering. It doesn't have that delicious hydraulic connection to the road. Um, but it's certainly not bad for electric. I do feel like I know what's going on still. A little short throw, nice little action. Um, it's not particularly weighty, but it is precise, which is nice. Now, this is one of those cars that I'm quite interested to see how, on the, on the, on the scale of sports car to GT, which way does it lean more? Um, Tom describes it himself, the owner, as uh, a, a GT really that's got kind of sporting credentials and I can see that already. I'm surprised by how comfortable this is straight out of the, straight out of the box. Um, it's a very low car and the buyer's guides suggest, a lot of them suggest not lowering these and that they're already as low as they should go before you go to expensive coilovers. The headline benefit of the Z4 Coupe over its convertible counterpart, it is twice as rigid. And so when you're moving the steering wheel and you're moving around, you can feel around you the tautness of this chassis and it's definitely there. I don't think it's ever gonna inspire MX-5 levels of confidence when really pressing on, but I don't think most drivers really want to push this as hard as they can. And during my time researching what owners think of this and problems and that kind of thing, you know, I, I read one particular comment that's really stuck with me. The, to paraphrase, somebody was saying, yeah, the front end does hunt the cameras in the road. It, it, it has a lively front end, but it's a car that overall, you feel like you're driving it and it's not driving you. You have to concentrate. You're holding, holding the wheel. You're really like reading the road as it comes. Uh, and a lot of people describe the handling on the limit as quite spiky. Tom, on, on the tyres that it came on, um, in a situation he wasn't expecting, had the car spin on him. He's actually spun this thing and he's not, a, he's not a bad driver. You know, it doesn't give you a big margin for error and it's something that you have to respect. 
And so to some people, that is their definition of a sports car. They love that adrenaline, the, the excitement of, Christ, you know, I'm, I'm fighting the beast. To other people, once they have one of those experiences that spits them up and chews them out, they bloody hate it. And they're like, I don't want a car that's so unpredictable when, when the going gets tough. <laughs> Did you hear that? That is fucking gorgeous. Oh, heavens. Oh, sorry. Oh, wow. Okay, that is lovely. This car definitely feels like a sense of occasion to drive. And given that most of us don't really find the opportunity and not always really want to drive our cars to their very limit, this is one of those cars I can imagine every time you go anywhere in it and it feels like a little treat to yourself. It's what the two-seater sports car is all about. Yeah. I think what will help what will help you place where this car belongs in a consideration list is Tom himself was a uh, McGann RS250 owner before, so he'd had a bloody, bloody capable, brilliant hot hatch with a slightly uninspiring engine tone. It didn't feel like that much of a sense of occasion for when he drove it, but, you know, arguably fantastic car. Indisputably a brilliant driver's car. Oh, fuck that noise. Um, so yeah, he wanted something a little bit more special. He wanted naturally aspirated and he was considering a Cayman as well, so he did have the budget to go up and get an early Cayman. But, you know, to get a healthy one at 15K, yes, it is gonna be a better driver's car than this. Everybody knows that. But, you know what? 5.7 to 60 for this car, 262 brake horsepower, uh, just a special, rare little GT Cruiser. There's, there was a, for every 11 Z4 convertible sold, there was one of these sold, and you hardly see these anywhere. So they do feel arguably more special than the Cayman. Where does the newer Z4 compare? Okay, stop, wait two seconds. So my worst nightmare happened. I did actually have my phone fail on this first recording. Um, it's only about five minutes worth of stuff that I missed, which I normally trim down anyway. Um, but this GoPro, as my second shot, did catch the audio. The audio is fine as you'll see here when I'm sat still, but for once we get moving, I'm just gonna dub over the top. And actually, I'm gonna do a more concise version of what I was saying anyway. Um, so just bear with, the original audio does return very, very shortly. Uh, my apologies, I'm gonna make sure this kind of thing uh, doesn't happen in the future. But anyway, so we're on to the Z4 E89 now. And so this is the point where they kind of hybridize the whole thing. It's always a coupe with a hard top that can be converted to a proper convertible. And so it is the best of both worlds for sure. You get a proper, beautiful hard top that in the winter doesn't mess around with being some kind of leaky, leaky soft top. Um, but it's a very big step up in quality um, around this era. So you'll, you'll notice this, the shots between the two interiors now. It is a far nicer place to be than the previous one. And actually, that's not a knock to the previous set four. Um, the previous set four, I think, is still a lovely place to be and has aged very well. Um, but the, the, the quality is a huge step up in here. Now, the thing I do have to caveat is it's not quite fair. This is a very nicely specced one, and this is more like the kind of 10 and a half, 11,000 pound range. Um, so if you've got something more the eight and a half, nine, it's not, not quite gonna be here. I find the seats are more comfortable and actually a lot more comfortable. So this lovely E89 is the S-Drive 23i or 23i, however you want to say it. Um, and so this is another straight six uh, manual BMW Z4. And there are loads and loads of different Z4s you can get of this age. They kind of open the options up to turbocharged engines, uh, I think two different types of automatic gearbox, you know, some of the top end turbo engines like the 35, that, that thing is an absolute rocket and it's kind of five seconds to 60. So actually it's a little bit harder to just make a straight statement about the differences in the two cars. But luckily these two today, well, <laughs> when I was filming this, were actually very, very close choices um, to compare. So this one has 204 brake horsepower. It's 6.6 .6 to 60. And that obviously compares to about 5.7. 
for the Z4 Coupe. Um, and do you know what? I was really expecting a far greater difference um, in the feel of speed between the two. You're looking at about 180 uh, kilos difference, maybe 200 kilos difference between them as well. So it's down on power, up on weight, and down on stiffness. Um, and it really surprised me that actually it was a lot closer to that to that really enjoyable E86 coupe than I thought it'd be. Um, you know, steering again it's hydraulic and um, it's not too feelsome, but it's not it's not like you can't tell what's going on uh, at all. But interestingly, how does it feel for a driver's car? Well, I found it still feels like a large car. It's still got a very long nose um, and. I didn't feel that confident to push it very hard. It doesn't have that kind of pedigree like an M3, you know, something where you think, okay, the engineers have spent a hell of a long time to make this the class leader in handling and fun. Well, I don't think that's really ever what the Z4 has been about. And especially in the, in the latest guys, well, this guy's here, it's a it's about a cruiser. It's, it's a fun, really relaxing, like special sports car feel to it, but it, it doesn't have track pedigree. So I'm sure as familiarity comes to you with ownership, you, you do find that you can push it harder and harder and, and, and perhaps there's a layer of magic um, that, that you find when you, when you push it to its very edge. From what I've read, it doesn't seem to be the case, but I'm not going to rule it out because, you know, there are people out there with far more driving talent than me. Um, so yeah, it weighs a lot more. And in this instance, I was very surprised to find comfort Oh my God! See what I mean about oh Christ! You see what I mean about the uh, about the crashy suspension there. A bloody GoPro couldn't handle that. Actually, it was less comfortable than Tom's E86 coupe. But that extra weight crashing on that firm suspension, it really you you felt the road a lot more, and it, it wasn't necessarily a positive thing. It wasn't terrible either, but that was a surprise. This is why you buy a Z4. Uh, they, they both sound fantastic. And the 204 horsepower in this car, I actually felt like it felt quicker than that. Um, I felt like that power figure doesn't really tell the full story. It pulls strongly in each gear, it sounds great. And I've said it before, I think it's around that six to seven seconds in, on the UK road specifically, I think it's the absolute sweet spot. It's enough power that it's exciting, but you've got time to actually play and to ring out your engine. I think the handling of the E89, it's, it's, it's impressive for the size and the weight that it is. It is a nice handling car, and especially at you know anything below eight tenths, it was just a really enjoyable place to be. I think where both said fours score highly is in the real world application of them. So yes, okay, my MX-5 is a, is a greater driver's car than both. And both of the owners, Tom and Matt, did agree. They said, your car by far has the best handling here. It feels the most fun to drive. But where the real world comes into play is, this is a car that you've got to justify, often to a partner who's not as much a petrol head as you. These, these cars are comfortable. They have huge usable boots. They have lovely interior that's, that's a pleasure for the passenger as well as a pleasure for the driver. BMWs aren't notoriously reliable and it's, it depends massively on which BMW you're sat in at that moment in time. Some are reliable, some are famously not. But the good news is the Z4s are actually really, really good. They're very dependable. They've got a few little issues. Go look them up. But I would buy one for myself in the future um, in terms of reliability. I know it's not going to be Japanese, but if it were a second car for me as a little toy and a treat, then yeah, I would, I would do that. And so to conclude, well, it's been quite an interesting day. We've had a few bizarre events, up, down, rain, beaching and whatnot, but this is the review I've really, really looked forward to. I had my own ideas kind of made up before I arrived, which you're not supposed to, but you can't really help but think, I think I know which one I'm going to prefer. I think I know which one's gonna be a little bit more fun. And well, yeah, lose 180 kilos, add some power, add some stiffness. And obviously the E89 is the more drive enthusiast car. And to my surprise, 
Fuck you. Damn it. Oh, that's such a good one. Fuck, I wonder how many times I said E89. Nuts. Fuck's sake. Oh, whatever. Obviously, the E86 is the more fun car. And to my surprise, I actually felt it was slightly more compliant. I actually felt that car was a little bit more comfortable as well. And yet, what really surprised me was that despite all of these things, despite that it was better, the margin to me by which it was better was not actually that much. I found that this was, to me, it felt like to me 90% of that car, but with a far nicer interior, greater flexibility of being able to use it as a convertible, and really, that's the one that you'd probably want to live with. So, as a die-hard petrolhead fan, which one would I take? Well, it can only be one car. The Suzuki Wagon R. There's nothing else like it. The way that thing goes around a B road, lift off oversteer, peeling paint, you, you just, it's so hard to find now. So yes, to keep you waiting, which one would I go for? Well, if I were looking at my wallet, I feel like this is the investment piece. This is the car which people are starting to appreciate is a much more affordable Z4M. And here's a lovely chocolate lab to come join us today. It's the, certainly the car that feels more rare and special and you, you see none of them on the road. But for me, well, too much of life is spent driving on roads that aren't fun. Too much of life is spent dreaming of those good roads. And I think this is the car that I'd rather be in for those occasions. So with my money, I would be stumping up for one of these. I've said it before as well. I'm unsure, I'd have to drive both, but I'm unsure whether I'd go for the, the harsher M Sport suspension as well. There's no real defining one. It's gonna depend who you are and what you prioritize. So if you enjoyed this video, give it a like, a subscribe and all that jazz. And um, yeah, see you for the next one. Thanks very much.